with a link to a lecture for the background kind of stuff of the Renaissance in the 17th century. And I really ought to do the same for uh, Shakespeare, but I don't know that I will. <laughs> um, since we do, we are very limited in the number of days. So let's start the sonnets, and I'm just trying to decide, and I don't think I will. Damn, I have to. Thinking of not including some stuff about the sonnets, but you have to. Your introduction on pages 884-885 talked about when the sonnets were begun, when they were first printed, and raises the question of who they were intended for. Actually, hold on just a second. Yeah, it kind of raises the question. On um, page 884, in the second paragraph, mentions the, there's nothing else about this, huh. um, mentions who is the WH whom the printer Thorpe calls the only begetter of the sonnets. Because the sonnets, and I, I just went to my office to try to see, uh, to get a copy of the sonnets that I have, but I forgot all my copies of the sonnets are at home. Because um, I have a, an edition that has a facsimile of each page of the original edition of the sonnets, and it includes this dedicatory letter. Most books, many books in the Renaissance and, and really up through the late 18th century, began with what's called a dedicatory epistle. Okay. or letter, okay? And the dedicatory epistle or letter was written usually to one of two groups, okay? One group is the patron of the author, the person who is financially supporting that author, and the other is the reader or readers. Right? You'll often see books that begin something like gentle reader or gentle readers, etc. And then you get this letter, and the letter is essentially telling you how the person wants you to read or interpret his or her book. Right? Um, we're going to see, because I'm going to you know, sneakily add them in uh, when we get to Johnson and Herrick, a couple of these kind of poems, dedicatory poems. Poems that begin at the beginning of a book to tell you, this is how I want you to read my book and don't read it any other way, kind of a thing. Okay? We can do with that as we will. Anyways, Shakespeare's sonnets began with, to WH, the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, blah, 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 blah. We don't know who WH is. It's a, it's a hugely important question because... According to some, um, by calling W.H. the only begetter, be begetter may mean the person who physically obtained the sonnets for the printer to publish, in which case it's probably not Shakespeare writing this. It would be Thorpe, the publisher, the printer, saying that. That's one meaning of a begetter, and who the WH doesn't answer the who, but you know why WH is important. The other one is WH is the inspiration for the sonnets. See, the sonnets, 154 of them, are divided generally into 1 through 126 and 127 to 54. 1 through 126, for the most part, Notice big qualification there. For the most part, are addressed to a young man. He's he's kind of generally called or referred to. Don't refer to him in the paper, all caps this way, if you write a paper about this. Golden-haired youth. He's a young man, blonde, curly, long hair. Okay? Four. But not... Butcher, shaving short, four. So, 
I usually just abbreviate that GHY, golden haired youth. Okay? They're generally to him. Now, in those 1 through 126, there are references to a couple of other people. All right? Um, like, for example, speaker's mistress. Okay? 127 through 154 are generally, with some exceptions, to the dark lady. Okay. Dark there meaning black. Referred to um, every now and then, or there are a couple of references to her possibly being a Moor, like a fellow of the Moor, that is, someone of North African descent. Okay? This is the speaker of the poem's mistress. Okay? The speaker of the poem, the persona's mistress. Don't think, don't assume that the speaker of the poems is Shakespeare. Never fall into that trap of assuming that the persona speaking the poems is the author. A right? um, couple of you on your, your um, old English exam, you assumed that the seafarer is the poet. You can't make that assumption. The seafarer is a persona created by the poet. Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales is the persona Geoffrey Chaucer created by the author Geoffrey Chaucer. <coughs> we know they are not the same person. Because the persona Jeffrey Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales is an idiot. Mm -hmm. And the real person Chaucer obviously was not. His tale is so bad that they make him shut up. He doesn't get to finish the tale. They stop him. Well, nobody would really do that with the real Chaucer because he was a pretty good poet. You know? So, generally to him, generally to him. Uh, excuse me, to her or about her. Okay? And then somewhere, let's take this out. You know, you have the speaker slash persona, okay? And what develops in the course of the sonnets is, so you've got this, you know, kind of back and forth, so to speak. We never hear this person speak, but it's kind of back and forth. It's about their relationship. And then within these develops a relationship between these two, how? Because this person introduces this person to this person. Okay? The persona introduces, somehow, his mistress to this golden-haired youth. And they start having sex. It's pretty clear. They start sleeping together, which creates problems for him. Okay? And then 1 through 127 through 54 are largely about this. But they're also somewhat about this. Because some of what he's saying to her in these is, you foul whore, you took away my friend. Okay? This relationship, okay, I will argue, that is, I'm going to give you my interpretation. I'm not saying that I am absolutely correct, though I am saying I am absolutely correct. This relationship is not homoerotic. It is not a relationship based on sex. It is a relationship based on love. Love is not sex. Sex is not love. Go to any bar. Here's your proof, okay? And it's going to become pretty clear in one of the early sonnets we're going to talk about why it's not about sex. The speaker is going to talk very bluntly about sex and sexual pleasure and it's the speaker is going to make it clear i don't want any of that what i want is how are you going to equate that with mine what's up here not knowledge soul if you want okay now this kind of you know mess this shows up a lot in Renaissance poetry. John Donne will do the same kind of thing, but it won't be about 
his golden-haired youth friend and his mistress, etc. It'll be his mistress in God. Not that she's having sex with God, but his relationship with God, his relationship with his mistress, and, and what Doug likes to do is he talks about the relationship with God in not this sense, but in the sex sense, erotic. And God, I want you to have all of me. Don't just take my heart. Take everything, body and soul kind of a thing, okay? We'll get to that later. I hope. <laughs> so, that's what's kind of going on in the sonnets, all right? W.H., who could it be? I don't think you're in your introduction... Yeah, your introduction doesn't mention any of the possibilities, and I did not bring in my notes that has those possibilities. One, however, I do remember. One is a guy named William Herbert. And the other one is Henry Ryoffison. I think I spelled that right. Um, William Herbert, who is a patron of Shakespeare's. Okay. Shakespeare dedicated an earlier poem to him. <coughs> Henry Rothsley was another patron of Shakespeare that Shakespeare dedicated a poem or two to. Okay? But notice, this isn't H.W., this is W.H. Well, reverse this. And this was a commonplace also. Use somebody's initials, but reverse them so that it wasn't real obvious. Okay? The nice thing about Henry Rothsley is at the time the sonnets start being composed, we believe, mid-1590s. Um, probably when the playhouses are shut down because of plague. Uh, it, we, we know what Henry Rothsley looked like. He was young, he was handsome, and he had long, curly, yellow hair. He kind of matches, uh, matches the golden-haired youth very well. Okay, so, turn to the sonnets. And it's not on the syllabus, but we're going to really, really quickly look at number one because it's the, it kicks them off. It begins it, okay? And it begins the theme really for the first 20 or so because the first 20 or so are pretty much all about one thing. Go make babies. Go have children, okay? Should I use this again? I'll probably will. Um, so, from fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as the riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. I'm making it rhyme as it would have in Shakespeare's day. But thou, contracted to thine own bright eyes, feeds thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel, making a famine where abundance lies, thyself thy foe to thy sweet self too cruel. Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament, and only herald to the gaudy spring, within thine own bud buries <coughs> thy contempt, and tender churl makes the waste in niggardine. Pity the world, or else this glutton be, to eat the world's dew by the grave and thee. What's he telling the, the recipient of the poem? Look at the first two lines. From fairest creatures we desire increase. Bingo! Thank you for being the one to say that. We want beautiful people to increase. We might want to also be all high-minded about ourselves and say, well, we want all people to have that chance. But if we're all really honest, look in the mirror, go deep, deep with inside, you don't want the 500 pound person with, you know, the nose down here and shoulder up like this, you know, uh-uh. You don't. We don't want ugly people to increase. We want beautiful people to increase. That's what he's talking about. If you had your pick between, you know, these two people increasing and filling the world with their children, do you want Kevin James or any, except for the fourth brother, or any Hemsworth? <laughs> I, I, 
short and fat. He's Kevin James. <laughs> Most people would say, pick a Hemsworth. And, you know, Liam, Chris, I don't even remember the other ones now. Fred, Tom, what's the third one? Ben? Or maybe it's the third one, not the fourth one. But one of those two, not the other, okay? Or Danny DeVito or, you know. <laughs> I agree, Danny DeVito, but Thor. <laughs> Why? But as the riper should by time deceased, his tender air might bear his memory. Because what happens, right? With Chris Hemsworth in 40 years, he's not going to look the way he does now. Unless he's got like Sean Connery's jeans. <laughs> as my wife would say, the guy's going to be 120 and she's still going to be the hottest man alive. He's like 90 now, you know? No, what's going to happen? going to age. <laughs> He's going to get all saggy, you know. Pity the world. Have pity on the world. Or this glutton be. Why? Eating, meaning keeping to himself. What? What is the world's due? What you owe to the world. Talking about leaving chromosomes lying around and stuff. The speaker here is saying what? You owe the world. You owe the world to reproduce. You ugly person who go hide under a rock, you know, don't right? Crass? Yeah, kind of. Very platonic, however. Why? Because Plato said the outside reveals the inside. If you're pretty on the outside. You're pretty on the inside. And if you're ugly and foul on the outside, you're ugly and foul on the inside. Okay? For a pretty deep guy, that wasn't a very deep thought on, <laughs> on his part. So, then you go straight to number two. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow, and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, thy youth's proud livery so gazed on now, will be a tattered weed of small worth held. Then being asked, where all thy beauty lies, where all the treasure of thy lusty dies, to say within thine own deep sunken eyes, where an all-eating shame and thriftless prize, how much more prize deserved thy beauty's use, if thou couldst answer, this fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse. Proving his beauty by succession thine. We stop right there. How many of you know somebody, or maybe, you know, maybe you're this person, um, where you could look at that person and look at, say, that person's, you know, one of the person's parents or grandparents, or maybe a great grandparent, a photograph, and go, dead giveaway. Okay? Got a friend. She used to have, you know, in her house, picture of her, I think, great-great-grandmother. I'm not kidding. Spitting image. Looks exactly like my friend. And yet, great-grandma's been dead 100 years, you know. Okay? My four kids, three of them, everybody, when they were, I mean, from 0 to 15, go, Ted, Ted, Ted. And my youngest one, Karen. <laughs> Karen. I mean, nothing alike. That's what he's saying. Why is this important? When? 40 winters. Now, I, I could be wrong here since I'm 57. 40's not old, folks. <laughs> now, it is to you because you're looking you know, 25, 30, you know. When 40 winters shall besiege thy brow. Besiege. What does that mean? Lay siege to, like an army getting ready to storm the castle. And 40 winters are going to do what to your brow? Because when you're 20, your brow, unless you're studying for exams or finals or you have me as a professor, your brow is generally <laughs> smooth. 40 win winters, you start getting those lines, glory lines and such. And dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field. Where is beauty's field? How do we know someone's beautiful? 
No, it's not their heart. <laughs> it's this. Thy use proud livery. What's livery? The clothing. Specifically, it would be, you know, for a particular night, all the people who worked for him would have a set uniform, so to speak. So it's your uniform. This is, however, youth's proud livery or uniform. So what uniform does youth wear? Louder? Skin. Skin, okay. <laughs> if you're a woman, what is a characteristic of beauty for a young woman? Makeup's an addition. Shakespeare's going to talk about that because that has nothing to do with that. Why? And a, a Saint, uh, Sarah, Palin, Sarah Palin famously said, you can do what? You can put lipstick on a pig. Still makes the pig a pig. That is, Shakespeare is going to write one of his sonnets. You can make what is foul fair with makeup. No. Natural beauty. Clear skin, right? Smooth skin. Not skin pockmarked, you know, with chicken pox scars and acne scars and everything. Most people would say, rightly or wrongly, I don't give a rat, you know what? That's not beautiful, okay? So smooth, clear skin, nice clear complexion, that's what he's getting at. What's going to happen? To that beautiful skin, 40 years, or when you turn 40. So gazed on now is telling us what? This person walks into a room, it's like a Hemsworth. I could be telling you something extremely profound. Chris Hemsworth walks in that room, or, you know, Tom Hiddleston, and all eyes are going to be there. No? Really? Okay, whatever. <clears throat> My daughter's eyes wouldn't be there. She'd be crawling over glass. <laughs> <clears throat> or she would have five years ago. Maybe not now. Yeah, probably now. <laughs> Especially if he is dressed as Loki. You know? So, it will what? It will be a tattered weed. He uses weed because weed is another term to describe clothing. Your weeds. What you're wearing. Okay? It will be what, though? Because when you go from 20 to 40, especially metaphorically within the space of two lines, what happens? <laughs> then, when you're 40, being asked, what happened? That's what where all thy beauty lies. I'll use Brennan because I won't get in trouble there. <laughs> if I see Brennan tomorrow and we both go through a time machine, and it's 20 years later, we're not going to talk about me, because, I mean, it's already there. <laughs> and I go, man, what happened to you? You know, because he shrinks two inches, and he fills out, you know, several inches. Or one of my earlier classes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I've got a football player who sits right here. The guy's like this tall, and he's Mr. Incredible. Okay? Put 40 years on him, and he'll be like Mr. Incredible, before he becomes, again, Mr. Incredible. He's like this rapidly. Okay? What's his point? Somebody's going to look at you and not recognize you. I bet there are people today that if they never knew who this actor was, <coughs> as soon as I said that, his name just went poof. <laughs> Mel Gibson. If they never knew who Mel Gibson was and they looked at Mel Gibson today and they looked at Mel Gibson from the Mad Max films, they would never know. Same actor. Why? It doesn't look like him. Changed a lot, okay? Lethal weapon, Mel Gibson. Where, they will also ask, where all the treasure of thy lusty days? What's the treasure of thy lusty days? Well, treasure is something you produce, right? It's what you earn, it's what you get. So, what'd you do? Where's your babies? Where are your children? Come on, show them to me. How many of you seen the film Hook? Rob, one of Robin Williams' you know, great performances. You remember the scene when, when Peter Banning goes back to Neverland? I had to take my glasses off for a reason. Goes back to Neverland and he's found by the Lost Boys. And there's the one little black kid who goes up to him. 
And they're trying to get him to become Peter Pan again. And he goes up to him and he does this. And he pushes his face all back. What's he say? There you are. There you are. Yeah. In other words, get rid of the wrinkles, get rid of the fat, get rid of the flab. But what's he doing? He's looking in his eyes. Oh, there you But what's the speaker saying? I don't have any young eyes to look. What did you do with your youth? Come on. Get busy. <laughs> have children. What kind of poem is this? Starts with a C, ends with arpe. Starts with a D, Carpe ends with an M. Thank you. <laughs> arpe DM. Seize the day. Why? God forbid you might walk out of this class and get killed today. <laughs> James just goes, damn. <laughs> Every single class I have with this guy, he's, you know, wait, wait to start my morbid <laughs> SOB, okay? <laughs> to say that your beauty is what? Peter Banning's, within thine own deep sunken eyes, were an all eating shame and thriftless, thriftless, producing nothing. Praise. How much more praise deserved thy beauty's use? If you could say, here, here's the treasure of my youth. Now go to the final couplet. So, proving his beauty by succession nine, that is, someone looks at him and goes, yeah, okay, that's clear. This were to be new made when thou art old, and see thy blood warm when thou feelst it cold. Keep that couplet in your mind, because we're going to get to a poem, last day of class, that's going to bring up that same idea of cold blood. Not like in Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, not whole, not murders, but the idea that the older you get, what happens to your blood? It cools. How? How so? Is this just because they're medically ignorant? Maybe. Emotionally, calm down a little bit. Okay, possibly. They mean literal. Like you're dead? Close. Dying. Close. Because to some people your age, I'm mostly dead. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a lot closer to that six foot plot of ground than you guys. You know, if everything goes according to how it ought to go, okay? The idea is that when you were young, your blood is warm and or hot. As you get older, it cools. So, an example. This water is relatively warm, let's say. And notice it's what? It's, it's still very fluid, right? I mean, if I take the lid off and do that, <laughs> I put it in a freezer for a few hours and do that, what happens? Why? It's gotten cold. Better example. Those of you who like bacon would like this. Cook a bunch of bacon. Take the bacon out, leave the grease in the pan. And you can do this with the pan and it sloshes back and forth. Cool, right? It's so hot, okay? <laughs> leave it there a couple hours. That's my blood. <laughs> Hard music. It's fit, it congeals. So, yeah. Because it's not fresh. Because I'm getting older. I'm getting, I'm wearing out, you know. <laughs> but when you're young and hot, various meanings of the word, your blood is hot. It's coursing around through your body. Another poem's going to talk about that, okay? This were to be new made when thou art old and see thy blood warm. Notice, see thy blood. How so? Well, whose blood is it coursing through that child's body? Mine and my wife's or whoever else's, but it's partly mine at least. Okay, and it does what? I feel a little more alive seeing you, Johnny. And then you know, Johnny leaves, eh, you die. Go from there to uh, one, two, eighteen. One of one of Shakespeare's great poems. This poem is, if, if you have a collection called, you know, 100 Great Love Poems, like 
100 great poems, great love poems of the world. And that means like in, including love poems in French and, and uh, Roman, Italian, <laughs> French, Italian, Portuguese, you know, because there's great love poems in written all the, the hot romance languages, so to speak. This is always included. But those 100 great love poems, that love there almost always means eros, romantic, slash sexual love. It's not what this is. <laughs> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. <laughs> Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometimes, excuse me, sometimes, too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines. By chance or nature's changing course, untrimmed. But, huge but, we're going to talk about what that means in a moment. Thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long as this and this good life can be. Notice the rhythm of that couplet, the final one. So long as men can live, excuse me, so long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long as this. Pause, and this gives life to thee. Okay, so, shall I compare you to a summer's day? It's like the speaker and the person being spoken to are sitting down. Are you like a summer's day? Hmm. No. Why? You're more lovely and more temperate. Temperate means what? Mild. What else does temperate mean? I mean, Megan's entirely right. It does mean mild. Even. Okay, because summer can be what? Summer can be really hot, and sometimes, even in Murfreesboro, you can have cool summer days. It can go up and down. Well, if you've been in England during the summer, or London during the summer, I've been in London when it's been 103 degrees. Hottest on record. And they don't know how to make air conditioners. And they don't know the recipe for ice. <laughs> Supposedly a modern country. Right? And I've been in London when it's been 55 degrees in summer. And it's a lot more 55 than 103. I've been in London several summers when the high temperature's been maybe 75. That's why I like to go to London in the summer and get out of Murfreesboro. So more temperate means more mild, staying like this, and more even, and you don't have the wild fluctuations that you can have in a summer day, okay? Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Well, May's not really summer, right? May still spring. Well, May showers, <laughs> May storms, and summer's lease, what's meant by lease? How many of you signed a lease to get into an apartment? What's that mean? contract for what? What happens when the date on the lease is up? Keep taking all that out of there. Or you sign a new lease, right? So how does summer have all too short a lease? Unfortunately, not in Murfreesboro, right? <laughs> Sometimes summer goes way past September 22nd. I, I can remember a couple of days, late October, early November, and it's 90 degrees. Not in England. Not in England. I mean, there's... Um, London's had snow before in September. Okay? And Shakespeare lived, by the way, during one of the little ice ages. I want to say it was 1615, something like that. Um, the Thames froze like in May. Froze. Froze. I mean, really cold, okay? So, rough winds do shake the darling buds. May, summer's lease hath all too short a date. That is, summer might end early. 
Sometime too hot the have, eye of heaven shines, the sun, and often is his gold complexion dim. Well, how do you dim the sun? Clouds. And every fair from fair sometime declines. Okay? Every fair, every beauty from beauty sometime declines. What does it mean to decline something? It doesn't mean no. It falls away. So sometimes beauty from beauty falls away. So imagine beauty as having two ears. And one falls off. You're a leopard suddenly. Well, that would be beauty declining from beauty, right? Beautiful complexion. And you go to the beach in Ecuador. For eight hours and you put nothing on and what happens when you come back no beauty <laughs> okay that's the beauty from beauty declining how though by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed so the beauty declines from beauty by chance how can that happen an accident Freak accident, etc. Idiot, you know. People last year, two years ago, were running, running around in London, throwing acid in people's faces because they could, because they're idiots. That's I chose that word intentionally. Okay, or nature's changing course. The years roll on. That's <laughs> nature's changing course, and what does that do? It untrims. The word that's used in the book, untrim. What does it mean to untrim something? We don't use that word at all in modern English. We do use this. Particularly, we use it in two national holidays or celebrations. I don't mean national rah rah the flag. I mean, United States as a nation generally does it. Turkey with all the trimmings. trimmings. What's that mean? Do you trim stuff and put it around the turkey? Then you go get plants and trim the leaves? And, no. The trimmings are what? All the little extras. All the little accoutrements you put on. What are the trimmings? Mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, whatever you have for Thanksgiving. Okay? And what comes about 30 days later, usually? You trim the tree. Doesn't mean you literally, if you celebrate Christmas, you put up a tree and you get a pair of snippers and you go around and you trim all the branches <laughs> so you have that nice, perfect triangular tree. It means putting the decoration, the ornaments on. So what does nature in its unchanging course do? It undecorates. It takes our natural early, youthly ornamentation and makes you look like me. <laughs> well, not literally. Thank God. So, he says, but Shakespeare is writing what are called English lines. Okay? Which are made of three quatrains okay, and a final couplet. What's a quatrain? Four line stanza, generally, you know, A B A B A B B A. Um, yeah, that's generally it. Okay. He's not writing Italian or Petrarchan sonnets. Okay. He is writing Petrarchan in a different sense, what I'm, I'll talk about in a moment, convention. But he's not talking, he's not writing Italian sonnets, which are made of. The octave and the sestet. Octave, first eight lines, sestet, last six lines. After the octave, you get what's called the volta. Volta means turn. Okay? So in an Italian sonnet, sonnet, you get the octave, and then there's a turn. There's a, a change of emphasis. Okay? Shakespeare's three quatrains, final couplet. 
But he uses this idea often at the end of line eight. But, what does but always imply? I really like your class, Dr. Sherman, but no. what do you like think it. I'm going to emphasize? The reason you don't like it. Yeah, what's the but? You were good until you got to the but. You should have just stopped when you were in. Because the but implies, but I don't really. I, this is, okay. But thy what? Eternal summer. Notice. This will not be a summer with a lease, a summer with a determined date. Thy eternal summer shall not fail. Okay, how, how are you going to work this magic? How am I going to live in a youth forever? Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. What's that fair? The beauty of youth. Nor... Shall death brag the wanders in his shade? Okay, so this is even deeper magic. How are you going to keep me from dying? When in eternal lines to time thou growest. What's the speaker mean by eternal lines? Two meanings, by the way. Well, what happens as you grow older? Wrinkles. Now stretch that out to eternity. Then you're great. You get more and more and more and more and more wrinkled, right? Eternal lines. Imagine being alive in your body for eternity. How wrinkled and saggy are you going to get? You're going to get pretty wrinkled and saggy. That's one meaning, right? What's the other one? These lines. Why? We're still reading them. This poem was written 450 years ago, probably, minimum. Well, 400 be 1590 to 1990, 420 some years. And we're still reading it. The implication is, and probably another 420 years on, I think, people will still be reading this. I, I could be wrong. I don't think, even though I teach a course on it, I don't think they're going to be reading Harry Potter. But I think they're still going to be reading this, right? When in eternal lines to time thou growest. How so? Well, the couplet Shakespeare often uses as the summation or the conclusion. Like in a, a, um, a mathematical argument. One plus one equals, okay? Here it is. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, that is, as long, as long as men are alive, and he's not being sexist there, he means people, as long as humanity, what, can still breathe and can still see, because he doesn't know about Braille, they got to be able to read, so maybe we should add in, you know, and be literate, because who knows? <laughs> so long lives this, that is, this poem, and this gives life to thee. How many of you have read Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn? A few of you have. What's the, the general point of that? And it's not necessarily the beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that's all you need to know. What, what's important about that urn? It will last, if it lasts forever, what will last forever with it? The image that is on it. And the image that is on that urn, and I can swear I have seen that urn in the British Museum. Okay? Though I never found any reference to it actually existing. Anyways, <laughs> there's an image on that urn of a youth, a swain as he's called, chasing a woman. And she's just out of reach. And he says, but it's okay. Because for all eternity, you're going to be so close. And, but for her, it's also okay. Why? Because for all eternity, he won't catch me. I won't get raped. He'll be so close. Not there. Okay. And the point Keith seems to be making is this thing, he says, 
is piping a ditty, a tune no one can hear, but it is a kind of a spiritual thing. All right? Well, Shakespeare's doing the same thing here. Poetry can have what effect? It can memorialize, right? It can make you live forever. After all, he probably didn't exist. And people are still reading about that guy named Beowulf. How's that for eternity? He didn't exist. He didn't live. Hamlet did, and we still read about him, right? Now, male, female, object. Can we know? Does the speaker use a masculine com, you know, pronoun to describe the person that is being described here? No, because when it says often is his gold complexion dimmed, what's he talking about? He's talking about the eye of heaven. He's talking about the sun. Man. So we can't tell whether or not this is to a man or a woman. But generally, the first 127 are. So most people do take that as this is being to a woman. Okay, now go look, look at number 20. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou. Notice how the line runs on. Shakespeare doesn't want us to finish painted and pause. You don't pause until you get to that comma. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou. So what does that first clause tell us? Whoever the thou is, nature has done what? to that so far sexless individual other than painted with a woman's face. Who did the painting? Nature. Nature, nature how? Just nature rocks, plants, trees? No. He's talking about the goddess nature. Okay. So, nature painted you with a woman's face. And then we get the master mistress of my passion. The master mistress of my passion is in a positive phrase. Why? It's filling in thou. So who's the thou? Master mistress. Wait. One's male, one's female. How can it be both? Master of my passion? mistress of my passion. The speaker is saying, guess what? It's both. It's both. Master, commander of my passion, if the speaker is male, which we pretty much assume the speaker is, mistress of my passion, that is the object, the recipient, so to speak, of my passion. So, the controller of my passion, the receiver of my passion. You're both. Kind of like what the old lady in the wife of Beth ends up with, right? Gives her control and I'll be what you want me to be. Okay. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. An eye more bright than theirs, less false and rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazeth. A man in hue, all hues in his controlling, which steals men's eyes and women's souls amazes. And for a woman wert thou first created, till nature, as she wrought thee, fell a doting, and by addition me of thee defeated, by adding one thing to my purpose, noting. That's how that last word was pronounced in Shakespeare's day. Noting. Not nothing. Noting. Okay? Not noting. No. Ting, N-O hyphen T-I-N-G, okay? Let's leave the final couplet out for a moment. So, hast thou the master mistress of my passion? A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change as is false women's fashion. Well, what's a woman's gentle heart? That's the thou. That is, you have a woman's gentle heart. But then he qualifies that. But not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. Now, what does the false women's mean? 
is that an assertion that all women are false? Or is it just that some women are false? Some women who are false, they do what? They shift, as he put it, their fashion, their fashion shifts. Well, how so? It doesn't mean they're putting on different clothes. What's changing in false women? How so? You're right, Mark. The way, the way they act. Close? I mean, yes. How else? The way they act towards whom? Which men? And? How does it shift? How does it change? Lover? Oh, look, another one. Oh, look, another one. It's the old Stephen Bishop song. I think it's Stephen Bishop. Either Stephen or Elder Bishop. If you can't love the one you want, anybody know how the rest goes? Love the one you're with. Okay? Can't love the one you want, your lover. Have fun with whoever you're with. Okay? So, that's false women's fashion. Shifting change. And I'm more bright than theirs. Who's the theirs? False women. Okay? How so? Less false enrolling. Gilding the object whereupon it gains it. Remember we talked about medieval and renaissance notion of eyesight? How do we see? Not because of these things. It's because these things shoot out beams of light. They shoot out. I look. The light bounces back. and It makes an image in my mind somehow. Okay? So what's he saying? So what happens when you shoot out that beam of light? What does that light do to individuals? If I turned out the light, I brought in a mag light, and I were to shine it on somebody, what would that do to that person's face? It would light up, right? Or even better, if I came up and shot it behind the person's head, and you were looking from this direction, what would you see around the outside? How so? It would light just the outside, right? It would be like gilding. So what happens when you gild something? You heard the phrase to gild the lily? A lily is something that's pure. It's white. So what do you do when you gild it? You cover it, but you cover it with what? Gold. Why? Oh, it increases the value. Increases the purity, so to speak. Just the opposite, actually. Right? Why do people spray paint stuff with gold? It's tacky, right? It looks nice, but it's tacky, okay? So, and I'm more bright than theirs, less false in rolling. Why? Because their eyes are rolling. It doesn't mean they're like crazy people and they're sitting there, their eyes are rolling in their heads. What's it mean? Rolling from here to here to here to here to here to here to here and just all around, just rolling, you know, Marty Feldman, what I hear, what I go in this way, you know, the whole nine yards. If you don't know who Marty Feldman is, look him up. So, gilding the object whereupon it gazes. What, you know, what's the, what's the phrase that we say about love and seeing? It's love is where? In the eye of the beholder. Why? Go back to that first poem, Fairest Creatures, etc., we all know people who maybe are lovers, maybe they're married, whatever, and you know, you look at one of them and you go, how in the world did so and so ever end up with so and so? She's not pretty enough for him. He's not handsome enough for her. Well, what metaphorically happened in the eyes? Turn what outside eyes think of as not attractive into attractive. That's the gilding. That's the covering with gold. Because when you cover with gold, what do you do? You cover those imperfections. You, you gloss over them so that you don't see them. Okay? Gilding the object whereupon it gazes. A man in hue. Ah. Now we're told, even though a woman's face you were painted with by nature, a man in hue, your gloss tells you, Hue means appearance. You look like a man. Hmm. All hues in his controlling. How do you control someone else's hue? 
How do you control someone else's appearance? What are we being told about this man in hue? We could go back to one of the names I had up on the board a moment ago. Or, you know, many quote-unquote actors or celebrities. If you have five people walk into a room, and one of them is Chris Hemsworth, that's a man in hue, all hues controlling. Why? Because there aren't that many men that look like Chris Hemsworth, or Chris Evans, or Chris Pratt, or Chris Pratt, just, you know, rattle off all the Chris. Okay? <laughs> that's what he means. Which steals men's eyes. Why? Because the men look at that and go, it's not fair. It's just not fair that somebody should look like that. You know, if Chris Evans or Chris Hemsworth, you know, could sing, I mean really sing, not, you know, Leonard Nimoy, really bad singing, but good singing, it'd just be even more unfair. And then you find out, you know, they're an artist, like, I don't know, Rembrandt or something, that could paint beautifully. And then they're novelists also, and they write wonderful poetry. You'd want to kill them. <laughs> it just, it wouldn't be right. That's what he's getting at, all right? And women's souls amaze us. Why? It's not just the looks that attract the women. And for a woman wert thou first created. Now, modern English, that is, 21st century, 2019, we read that for meaning what? On behalf of a woman. That is, to be with a woman. Not what it necessarily means here. Here, it also has the meaning as. As a woman. Work thou first created. Till. What does till always imply? Which may change. Something's happening after that. Till nature, as she wrought thee, fell a doting. So, you know, he's down there on the operating table, Frankenstein's monster. Nature's painting. He doesn't have the scars and the bolts and everything. And, you know, everything's coming out fine. And nature's starting up here, right? Because she starts with the face and working on down. And nature falls a doting on this thing. Now, how is nature usually personified? Mother. A woman. Mother. Which can get kind of weird, but <laughs> Oedipus stuff. <laughs> Till nature as she wrought thee fell a doting. What does it mean to be doting? Like a doting old man or a doting grandmother. What does that mean, Brennan? Because you're close. Kind of like not quite all the way there. Losing focus a little bit. And by addition, me of thee defeated. Okay, so she added something to you that defeated me in terms of what I wanted from you. By adding one thing to my purpose, no ting. Okay. The pronunciation is no ting. The meaning, however, is nothing. How do you represent nothing? How do you represent nothing numerically? Let it sink in. She added one thing. Let it sink in. Play Freud. Yeah, I'm starting ah. to see. By adding one thing to my purpose, nothing, and then Shakespeare makes it clear. But since she pricked thee out, has the exact same meaning in Shakespeare's day in slang. The word prick. There it's a verb. It can also be a noun. Okay. Since she pricked thee out for women's pleasure, how? By adding the one thing that to my purpose was nothing. The speaker wanted the zero, the whole, where she added something. Up. Uh, <laughs> But since she pricked me out for women's pleasure, how? Because he now has something. Mine be thy love. 
and what? Thy love's use of their treasure. What's thy love's use? Sex. Sex. But give me your love. Where's that? Here? Here? Soul? The platonic ideal of love is what? You're really, 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 really good close friends with a member of the opposite sex, maybe. And somebody goes, yeah, what's going on between you? I, mean, I know you. And you go, no, 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 it's all platonic. And they go, yeah, right. What do you mean it's all platonic? It's all up here. Plato's realm of ideas, ideals. We share common ideas and such. No, no, no. We're not you base pigs. We're not down here in the realm of, of rank sex, you know, hamlets and semen bed, so to speak. Okay? This poem, I think at least, makes it pretty clear that the speaker, not Shakespeare, the speaker, the persona, is saying, I have a love relationship with this golden-haired youth that has nothing to do with sex. But in the 21st century, that's hard to accept. Why? Because for about the last 150 years, everything has everything to do with sex. But in the, I don't know, 5,000 years of human history before then? No. It was common for men to have relationships, women to have relationships that were close, bonding, that had nothing to do with arrows. Okay? It's a great poem. Go from there to... Ooh. I really shouldn't skip 29. I'm so screwed for time. Um, yeah, go to number 30. We might, we might come back to 29. I might, I might have to add another date just for Shakespeare. Somehow. Eek one out. Um, number 30. Next, so I gotta do 29, because 29 leads right in. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. Notice that's all one sentence. There's no pause. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. Outcast from what? Outcast from government? Is this an Anglo-Saxon exile poem? No. Well, it's kind of exile. Exiled from what? The beloved. The quote-unquote golden-haired youth. What's happened? Kicked them out? If they're living together? Possible. I don't think so. Something has intervened in this relationship that has caused the two to have to separate. Okay? In trouble, deaf heaven with my bootless eyes. Trouble? Listen to me, God! But they're bootless. Doesn't mean he's not wearing boots. It means remedyless. Praying, 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 and what happens? Hello, anybody there? Silence, silence, silence. And look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope. So I wish I was like this person. Why? Because this person has hope. I wish I was like this person. Why? Featured like him. If I looked like him, Maybe. Like him, this other guy with friends possessed, Mr. Popular, you know, desiring, oh, here's another one. This man's art, that is artistic ability, art there doesn't mean painting ability. It could be poetic ability. And that man's over there, scope, the range of his achievements. So the speaker's just compared himself to several different types of individuals saying, if only I was like. How often does that really ever help in life? If only I was like. If only I had. Yeah, doesn't count for anything. With what I most enjoy contented least. With whatever I enjoy, that's the thing that doesn't bring me fulfillment. Yet, in these thoughts, myself almost despising, 
Why? If I had hope like this man, then I wouldn't be the rotten wretch I am. If I looked like this person, then I wouldn't be dejected. If I had so myself almost despising, happily, I think on the happily by chance. Your name, your face pops into my mind. And then my state, that is the condition of my soul when I'm going through all this stuff, like to the lark at break of day arriving. What's the lark do when the sun bursts over the horizon? It bursts into song. What happens? From soul and earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. And yet what was it singing before at heaven's gate? Bootless, remediless, answerless, cries. Now it's singing. Which one do you prefer? Your boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other singing or crying? Your Parents, singing or crying? Yeah, I think most people go with the singing part, even if it's bad singing. You don't want to see someone you love cry. It hurts. Why? For thy sweet love remembered. Remembered implies what? Look at the tense. No longer. Past tense. Thy sweet love up here. What? Then, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Now that might be implying that the beloved is in the presence of kings or king or monarch. And the speaker is now not in the presence of the beloved. But the speaker says what? But I think about you and I'd rather be me any day. All right? Now look at number 30. I love this poem. Just, just listen to it. Don't read it. Just listen to it while I read it. It's so beautiful. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye unused to flow for precious friends hid in death's dateless night. And weep afresh love's long since canceled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought. Now, your gloss tells you sessions. These are judicial seatings. Like, the court is in session. What do we think that session means? Well, the judge has arrived. There's a bailiff. There's, you know, accused, um, defendant, prosecutor, etc. And witnesses and such. <coughs> yeah, that's all true. What else does it mean? It's like for sitting. When to the sittings of sweet, silent thought. Every one of you has done this before. You're by yourself. You may be going through a hard time. And what do you do? We have a phrase for this today. You throw yourself one of these. Some of the best parties you can throw, right? All you have to do is let it go, man. Just let it go. And just turn inward. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. What do you do when you summon up? That's magical language. Summoning is like bringing back something that is what? Gone. Dead. Buried. Like Saul summoning up the shade of Samuel in the Old Testament. Samuel's dead. He's supposed to stay dead. Leave him alone. And he brings him back. I summon up what? Remembrance of things past. What is it the stupid little warthog or whatever in, in the Lion King says? Hakuna Matata means what? No worries. No worries? I thought it was put your past behind you or whatever. Okay. No worries. Why? Because it's behind you. 
Because the past is past, right? You gotta, you gotta put your behind your past. Your past can't hurt you, can it? What can hurt you? The present. Future can't hurt you. Why? It's always future. It's only the present can. So, I, remember, I summon up remembrance of things past. And what does he think about? I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. One of the beautiful things about this poem is how Shakespeare plays with tenses. I sigh, present tense, the lack, still kind of present tense, of many a thing I sought. So, I'm sighing now, the lack now, of many things that I sought back then. And the implication is, when I didn't get those things back then that I sought, I went then. I also sighed then. So I'm re sighing I'm making worse what was already bad enough. That's why I said it's a pity party, man. And with old woes, new wail, my dear time's waste. <coughs> with old woes. Things that are in the past, I do what? I wail anew. I make them new woes of what? My dear time's waste. When? Both now and back then. So he's wasting his time again. Wailing over something he already wasted time wailing over. Get a grip, buddy. <laughs> then, so when I do all this, then... Can I drown and I am, we're told, unused to flow. So then he what? Cries. Over things that in the past, I didn't cry. I didn't weep in the past for these. For precious friends hid in death's dateless night. The speaker is telling us, I weep now. For friends, I didn't weep then when they died. Why? Why do you sometimes, maybe you've never had this experience, hope you don't. Why do you sometimes not weep over the death of someone upon their immediate death? Shock. Shock. It hasn't hit. It takes what? It takes time. Well, what happens once the time wears off, so to speak? Full force, man. Just turn those faucets on. Okay? And weep afresh. Ah, love's long since canceled woe. So the woe is long since canceled. Oh, I'm about to sneeze. Long since canceled woe. But whose woe? Or what's woe? Love's. So I weep afresh over love's long since canceled woe. What does he mean? Past lovers? Not a rhetorical question. How many of you have broken up before with somebody else? Yeah, I thought so. At the time, it was probably bad, right? Maybe now, looking back, depending on how far back it was. Well, <laughs> okay, let's just roll out the couch here and do some counseling. Now. <clears throat> let's let's go back in time a little bit more. Okay? If it was far enough back in time, you can what? You can look back on that quote unquote objectively, maybe or maybe not. You know, <laughs> it's canceled. It's over. It's done. Canceled. <laughs> And but do what? He does what? Weeps afresh. Why? Maybe I shouldn't have done. Maybe I should have done. Maybe it didn't need to be canceled. And moan the expense of many a vanished sight. The expense. The gloss tells you loss. Loss. Expense is also cost. Not cost, monetary cost. How about cost, soul cost? How it cost your soul that you invested in this person and then you got stabbed in the soul's back, so to speak. Yeah, that's a cost. Okay. 
Then, notice there's a shift between 8 and 9. Then can I grieve at grievances for God? When I do all these things, then I can do what? I can grieve now at long gone grievances and heavily from woe to woe tell over. The heavily, that's modifying what? Tell. Because tell doesn't mean speak. It means tell. Like when you go to a bank and you go through an ATM or a drive up, not ATM, and you speak to the person in the window whose job is bank teller. That's not because they're telling you things. They're counting. So when he says heavily from woe to woe <laughs> tell over, he's not merely thinking. He is recounting. All those woes of the past, which I knew pain. While he's in these sweet sessions of silent thought, it's like reliving every single one of them as if not paid before. Paid. That implies owing. Who's he paying? Himself, really. But, conclusion, if the while I think on thee, that is, if while I'm throwing the world's most massive pity party, and I'm sitting in these sweet sessions of silent thought, if you pop into my head, if I think of you, dear friend, all losses are restored, and sorrows end. Who obviously is not included in those losses? Whoever the friend is. And notice what that tells us about the value of the friend. All these other loves were what? They were but images of the friend. They were but precursors, attempts, trials. And we're going to see a poem later on by another author, Dunn, who's going to put this but he's going to put it in a much more crass sense. In, in fact, Shakespeare does it in one of the sonnets, because the speaker is going to say, you know, while you were away, what's the mouse going to do while the cat's gone? Boy, I'm going to play, man. <laughs> so if I'm married and my wife leaves for a while, not leaves, leave, I'm going to go find somebody else to keep me busy. Okay? That's not what this speaker is saying here. Okay? So, go from number 30, see if we can do one more. Uh, oh, yeah, 73. Five minutes. Yeah, we can do that. That time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the... Actually, we can't do this quite five minutes. We shake against the cold. Bare ruined choirs were late the sweet bird sang. So there's one image, right? It's a single image. What is it? You have the first four words. That time of year. It's a time of year. What time? Fall. Fall. Early winter. Okay? In me thou seest the twilight of such days after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. So, the end of the year, and then what? Next image. End of a day. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. The end of a fire. Okay? How many of you have been on a bonfire? Uh, especially a good one, you know, bonfire at the beach or something. So you build a bonfire, you put a bunch of wood on it, you light it, you watch it, you know, do stuff around it, etc. The fire burns down. What do you have in the morning? <coughs> you got a pile of ash. Do you go stick your hand in that ash? No. 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 Why? It's hot. Because there's glowing embers underneath the ash. Why? Because the fire has been consumed or has consumed its youth. The fire hot and flaming, that's all you guys. Pile of ash, that's me. Okay? That's what he's getting at. 
This thou perceivest. The whole purpose of those three quatrains is what? What's happening to me? Dying, Dying ending, <laughs> leaving, something like that. This thou perceivest which makes thy love more strong. Notice, you see these things in me. This thou perceivest which makes thy love more strong, to love that will which thou must leave ere long. Wait, you perceive these things in me? Who should be the one leaving? Me. I'm at the end of my year. I'm at the end of my day. I'm at the end of the fire. I should be the one leaving. You should love me because I have to leave. <coughs> we'll die. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. You have to leave me. Therefore, you perceive these things in me. That is, you perceive my ending. Why? Because you're going to see me. Something's happening between the speaker and the beloved. There's a whole lot more to say about that one. Um, yeah, on, on a Tuesday, let's come back and do at least 106, 116, 130. Go ahead and read the Johnson stuff for Tuesday also. What? Do you have an exam on Tuesday? What, exam? Yeah, I just said. I'm sorry. No, you don't have an exam until the final. What? Uh, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> that exam. I'm sorry. Thursday. Yeah, you have an exam on Tuesday. The middle uh, English one. I would have remembered. Uh, Tuesday morning. <laughs> And I would have said, hey, remember that essay exam I sent you? Do it in class. <laughs> With citations. Yeah. <laughs> From memory. <laughs> no book. Um, For my paper? Uh -huh.